Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal author series. And I'm very pleased to have Anna Ho with us today. Hi, Anna. Hello. Thanks for having me here. Oh, well, thanks for joining. Thanks for talking about your really lovely paper we're going to be discussing here in a bit. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Where, where are you at? Where are you located at? Um, I am in my apartment in okay. Berkeley. Uh, I just moved here in October from Pasadena. Uh, ah, having okay. just finished grad school. Oh, well, congratulations, Dr. Ho. Thank you. <laughs> I defended in an empty building, uh, which was a very interesting and uh, kind of anticlimactic experience. Uh, my, my committee, when they were telling me that I passed, uh, their connection was breaking up. So is it, and, uh, and, and then I, <laughs> what? I do, I do. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So, 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 so you actually did move to Berkeley. Um, I did. Yeah, I decided that um, I wanted to be here. So I moved from the inside of my Pasadena apartment to the inside of my Berkeley apartment. But it's been nice to still get the chance to explore the area a bit. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Bay Area is pleasant. Yep. And you're in Phoenix. I am in Phoenix. I am in uh, I'm at uh, Arizona State University. I'm in Phoenix and we are having uh, an early spring day, I will say. Uh, oh, it's nice. chilly in the morning. That's a relative statement, of course. Uh, so I'll say it's about 50. Uh, Fahrenheit in the morning and then it, we warm up to about 80 uh, okay. in the day so then it's quite pleasant um, sun is shining as usual um, yeah I like it it's great it gets a little bit to be a bear in July August but um, oh well <laughs> yeah <laughs> so is Berkeley um, are they having classes on campus are you going into the your office at all not at all yeah. yet. Um, so I'm also an affiliate at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, mm -hmm. and they're sort of open. People are going into work. Um, oh, okay. The Berkeley campus itself, I don't know of anybody who's going into the office. Okay. What about over there? Um, no, uh, unless it's some mission critical experiment, um, like those people who just got their instruments on Mars, right. uh, Perseverance. <laughs> um, so they go in and they do some stuff, but otherwise it's no. Uh, the plan is we're going to go full open in August. Uh, vaccines are moving well in Arizona. Uh, I got my first one three weeks ago. So next week I'll get my second shot. Um, so it's they're moving to vaccinate teachers uh, and other essential personnel. So basically they can get you know people back into school, which then opens up the adults to go back to work and blah, 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 blah. blah. So. It's, it's moving along fairly well in Arizona. I'm, I'm happy with where it's at. Okay, good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So Anna, what do you like to do for research? Uh, so I work broadly in the field of, I guess scientifically, the field of massive star death. Mm -hmm. um, and then technically, uh, the work that I do is in time domain astronomy. Yeah. So my supervisor in grad school liked to call it celestial cinematography. And so the idea is that you go and you take repeated frames, uh, repeated images of the night sky, mm -hmm. you make a movie, and then we look for things that uh, appear and disappear on time scales from hours to many months. Cool. And my particular focus has been the very fast things, so things that come and go within hours to a few days. Hours. Wow, that is short. Very cool. Nice. So that is going to bring us to this really lovely APJ article. The koala, it's even got yeah. a name. <laughs> Fast blue optical transient, F-bots, with luminous radio emission from a starburst dwarf galaxy at Z equals 0 0.27. And Anna, take us away. Yeah, thanks so much. So I guess um, since this is for a broad audience, before I talk about the paper or show any plots, um, I'll take a step just way back and provide some context for why this was an exciting discovery so the story really started in 2018 when the Atlas survey uh, was doing what I described. It was going and making a movie of the night sky and it detected a transient that was very unusually luminous for cosmic explosions and rose to that luminosity unusually quickly. And that combination really hadn't been seen uh, in transients before. And I was interested because in the meantime, uh, I had been doing my grad school work at Caltech and I had been looking for uh, relativistic explosions, engine powered stellar explosions, things like gamma ray bursts. Um, and to me, this sort of combination of very fast time scales and high peak luminosities kind of sounded like that, that kind of event. Mm -hmm. um, initially this event, uh, uh, this initial event, um, there were early reports of very bright X-ray emission 
And that started to sound like it had some kind of relativistic ejecta. So then that was why I personally got involved in this whole thing. And there was an enormous sort of worldwide observational campaign to study that initial object. It turned out to be very different um, both from gamma ray bursts and from basically any kind of transient that had ever been observed. So it was just a new type of phenomenon. Um, and you know, in the end, uh, with that first object, we were left really with a mystery, even though we had such a huge wealth of data. Uh, I think it seems likely that it was some type of massive star explosion. It seems likely that it produced what we call a central engine, so a newborn compact object that was actively powering uh, an outflow. Yeah. which uh, produced uh, luminous radio emission, uh, among other things. And so then um, the task was to find more of them and to understand what this class of objects was and what its relationship is to other engine powered explosions like gamma ray bursts. Mm -hmm. And so I set out to do that uh, with the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is another optical transient uh, time domain survey. Mm -hmm. So this object uh, was the first 18 cow analog discovered since the original one. Um, there was, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just say that. So it was the first one discovered, you know, in sort of quasi real time since the original one. Um, and that's what this paper was about. So it was presenting the basic properties of this event, comparing it to 18 cow. It was at a much higher redshift. So this was at redshift of 0.27, as you can see in the title. And 18 cow was only at 60 megaparsecs. So unfortunately, kind of mm -hmm. as a result of this high redshift, the data was not nearly as detailed but we were still able to say, you know, here's how this compares to the original. And that tells you something about the sort of diversity uh, of this um, emerging class of objects. So that's the very broad context. Cool. Uh, and now maybe I'll start going through the figures. So, you know, when you find a new, so 18 cow was totally singular, nothing like that had been seen. And so then the question was, how do we find more objects like this? And so I set out to understand sort of in the phase space of the of the rise time and peak luminosity of optical transients, uh, what is there? So here's the plot that, that I made to try to learn how to find these things. So on the x-axis, uh, it's showing the time from the half peak to the peak of the optical light curve. And on the y-axis, the peak luminosity. And so 18 cow you can see is up there um, on the sort of upper left. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, this is a very, um, you know, these are really sort of the fastest rising, most luminous optical transients out there. And there was a whole sort of menagerie of things. These were just all the objects that I could find in the literature that satisfied these criteria. It wasn't very many. Most of them uh, are remained unclassified. Um, so they did not uh, receive real time follow up observations. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this new transient. So ZTF 18 ABV KWLA. So it lives very close to 18 cow uh, in this part of parameter space. And also the name is why we called it the koala. We're trying to go with animal names for each new member of this class. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, th so then my suggestion, uh, you know, based on this plot is, okay, maybe we can identify these things on the basis of just picking out optical transients that have a fast rise time and a high peak luminosity because, you know, of the objects that live in the space space, a pretty significant fraction um, are this type of event. Mm -hmm. So that was the um, motivation for that. Since then, I've sort of revised this somewhat, which I can talk about maybe at the end. Sure. Um, but anyway, at the time, that's what that's what I was trying to do, find fast rising and luminous optical transients. Mm -hmm. so, so and uh, maybe we can go on to the plot of the light curve. We can skip the okay. about ZTFs mm -hmm. observing. Uh, okay. Like next observation. Yeah, there we go. So the light curve. Yep. yep, the optical light curve. So this object, um, this is showing the light curve um, out to 20 days since the first detection uh, with the apparent magnitude on the y-axis. And I'm so the points, the orange filled points and the green filled points on the left there, um, that's the light curve of this new transient in ZTF G band and ZTF R band. Okay. And so a few features just to highlight, you know, the time from the last upper limit to the first detection or to, to, to the peak was only a couple of days, uh, which is extremely fast for optical transients. Yeah. The peak luminosity, um, which you can see on the kind of right axis was minus 21, minus 21.5 mag. Again, mm -hmm. extremely luminous for optical transients. It then decayed over a time scale of just a few days. Um, and then that was basically it. We only had upper limits uh, after that. So 
So uh, I'm showing it there compared to the light curve of 18 cow. Yep. 18 cow, the rise was not resolved in that case, um, but you can see that at least the decay time scale and given the time scale of 18 cows last upper limit, um, the light curve really was extremely similar. Yeah. That's the point that we were trying to make uh, in that plot. And then on the top uh, there on the upper left, there's a small S mm -hmm. and that indicates uh, the epoch of spectroscopy. So we got a spectrum mm -hmm. of this transient right at peak. Uh, cool. Unfortunately, then it faded away so quickly we didn't get another spectrum. Uh, but that spectrum is shown, I think, in the next figure. Indeed. And it is extremely uh, blue and basically featureless. And so what this plot is showing is uh, that the spectrum of this object at peak light is well described by the underlying host galaxy spectrum, which had very strong narrow emission lines as so a strongly star forming galaxy with mm. a black body uh, at around 40,000 degrees Kelvin. Okay. So just a hot uh, optically thick uh, spectrum at peak light um, that has since proven to be quite a common feature of these kinds of events. Okay. So, unfortunately, you know, from a completely featureless black body spectrum, you can't say very much about what type of star exploded because you're not learning anything about the composition of the star. Right. Uh, but from the very high temperature, uh, you do learn something about the physical evolution of this event. So that was the that was a spectrum that we had. It's also how we measured the redshift and how we realized that this luminosity uh, was so high. So I guess part of the challenge with this kind of work is you know, to recognize these things right away within the first day or two uh, mm -hmm. in order to have the opportunity to trigger a follow-up spectrum and then measure the redshift. Um, and all of that has to happen just with a turnaround time of a few days. And maybe we can move on to the next plot. Very cool. Uh, right, so this is just showing uh, the host galaxy emission lines. I don't think we need to dwell on that. You know, you know in the field of um, when you're studying uh, stellar explosions, one of the things you want to do, I mean, we can just pause for a moment. One of the things you want to do is study the characteristics of the host galaxy, because mm -hmm. that tells you something, you know, for example, if it's a strongly star forming galaxy like this one, then that suggests that this kind of explosion came from, uh, from a massive star because it's a very young stellar population. So that kind of, when, when you don't have direct uh, spectroscopic evidence from the explosion itself of what it was, which in this case we did not because the spectrum was completely featureless, then the galaxy properties give you sort of indirect clues as to the origin of this event. So this was, you know, this kind of environment is very, very typical for, um, for is very, oh, it's very naturally explained by this being a massive star explosion. Argon. That's what we are trying to convey um, for this figure. <laughs> okay, cool, very cool. Right, so and I, when I um, sort of realized how fast rising and luminous this event was and how similar its light curve was to that of 18 cow, um, I triggered radio follow-up observations. Yeah. So we get observations with the VLA for these kinds of events and yeah. um, high frequency facilities like the Similimeter Array mm -hmm. uh, and Noema and Alma, um, because the what we're really looking for is whether these objects power powerful outflows like the original event. So you know, gamma ray bursts are known to do this. Uh, they form a compact object and then either through uh, you, you tap into either the accretion power onto this newborn black hole or the rotational spin down power of the newborn neutron star. And then you launch this powerful jet and that produces all the sort of characteristics we think of uh, as being typical of gamma ray bursts. And so in this case um, with 18 cow and now uh, the koala and then more recently actually um, another event, uh, it's becoming clear that this powerful engine powered outflow is also a common feature of these events. And so if you uh, let me go over to figure nine. Well. So that's showing uh, a collage of radio, low frequency, typically VLA light curves okay. of various classes of stellar explosions. Mm -hmm. And you can see these span many orders of magnitude in peak luminosity. So on the y axis, you know, it goes from 10 to the 35 all the way to 10 to the 42. On the x axis, the time scale is going from a day to thousands of days. Mm -hmm. 
And so there are kind of three luminosity regimes here that I'll point you to. So on the lowest luminosity end, going up to around 10 to the 37 ergs per second, you have uh, very nearby core collapse supernovae. So these are just fairly typical events yeah. where the only reason we detected their radio emission was because the event was so close by. And they typically, um, you know, so they'll rise uh, at early times and then they have a peak um, and then turn over again. And that's the sort of characteristic radio light curve shape um, from synchrotron radiation. Yes. And on the very top, above 10 to the 39 ergs per second, we have the very powerful ultra relativistic gamma ray bursts, um, a relativistic tidal disruption event. Um, and so these are the more, yeah, these are the most luminous uh, radio emitters uh, in terms of, um, yeah, cosmic explosions. And then in the middle regime, so between that, there's just a sort of whole, you know, combination of various sort of strange events, which, you know, not all of them are relevant to talk about now, but uh, 18 cow lives there. So you can see um, it there as a black curve um, with the stars. So it rose in a way that was sort of similar to events that have been seen in the past, but then it just plummeted after that, um, which is quite peculiar. Um, CSS 161010 is an event that took place actually two years before 18 cow. And since the discovery of 18 cow has been sort of reclassified, it was realized that it was actually a similar type of event. And once that was realized, uh, a group got radio observations and that's shown there. Mm -hmm. And then even above that uh, is the koala. So unfortunately we were quite slow to actually get those measurements. You can see we only got them at 80 days, which was a an unfortunate oversight. We didn't quite realize um, how unusual this thing was until then. We, now we have improved. Uh, we, we, won't, we won't make that mistake again. But in any case, we only got our first observation at 80 days. Um, and you can see it was even more luminous than the other two events. It's basically the only rival uh, is gamma ray bursts. So um, this is really, uh, that was quite astonishing. Um, and so it really seems like we have this totally new and distinct channel of, um, of engine powered explosions. Okay, so I have, that, to, I have yeah. to ask, what's, what's Dougie over here? Oh, this was another, so I was showing upper limits. I had done a, I did it big. So in that first mm -hmm. plot in figure one of this paper, I sort of identified um, here are all the transients that have ever been discovered that live in this part of parameter space. Most of which did not have follow-up observations because they just weren't recognized in real time. Dougie was one that did have follow-up observations um, it was a fast, luminous transient. I think it was in an old stellar population galaxy. So uh, something different from these yeah. new types of events. Okay. Uh, and so I thought, you know, I wanted to know whether any of these events had radio follow-up observations. I knew that most of them did not um, deliberately, but uh, the VLA has been conducting a sky survey over the last few years, um, right. the VLA sky survey. And so I thought, oh, maybe some of them serendipitously observed the position of these events. And so I just did a check at the position of each of those transients in my figure one and looked to see whether the VLA serendipitously observed the fields. And so those upper limits on the upper right, including for Dougie, um, were from the VLA sky survey. But as you can see, they're all very late after the event. So they weren't actually that constraining, unfortunately. Okay. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so this, uh, the fact that when we select transients via these sort of op unusual optical properties of the fast rise time, the high peak luminosity and so on, the fact that it seems, it seems like we can expect them to have this kind of luminous radio emission. So that's, you know, after that, that discovery and then the CSS event, and then another recent event, um, these are really coming together as kind of a group of objects that share, um, uh, a predictable set of properties in common. Now, maybe we can go on. Uh, maybe now I, I won't talk about the figure there. Um, right. So up, up there, I guess I did some calculations um, that I can just summarize. So the you know when you have a cosmic explosion or a supernova. You know, I think this event was likely to be some kind of massive star explosion, even though it's not a traditional supernova type. Um, one question is, what is powering the optical light curve? Mm -hmm. And in the case of, you know, stripped envelope supernovae, that their light curves are typically attributed to the radioactive decay, nickel 56 to cobalt and so on. Yep. And that gives you sort of a, predict a sort of uh, predictable range of 
light curve luminosities and time scales. But this particular event, you know, so fast rising, so luminous, so blue at peak, that's not definitely not radioactive decay and we need something else. Right. And I think one of the, you know, one of the uh, most likely possibilities is that you have your progenitor star and it's surrounded by, it, in the last maybe days to weeks, um, perhaps longer of its life, uh, it shed a significant fraction of uh, the material in its atmosphere and why a star might do that is not really known, but we know that they do that because we see the results of that in observations of supernovae. Mm -hmm. And so it sheds this material, um, or another possibility is that it just uh, becomes inflated. Um, but I guess the what's the what's underlying all of this is that somehow in the last moments of a star's life, there is some energy input into the outer layers of the star. It can puff it up. It can cause it to actually lose material. That material can become unbound. Uh, either way, the results uh, in the explosion is similar, which is that the star explodes and there's a collision of the stellar ejecta with that recently sort of yep. shed or puffed up material. And that collision can produce very uh, fast evolving and luminous optical radiation, which I think is likely what we were seeing here. Um, and so, you know, you can think of the reason for that is this material is very dense as so it's optically thick. Mm -hmm. And so basically at early times, the shock runs into it and photons diffusing from the shock can't get out because that material is optically thick. But then eventually, you know, the optical depth ahead of those photons drops sufficiently that they can kind of rush out. Mm -hmm. And so the time scale for them to get through the thin outer, outermost layer of this material sets the time scale of that transient. And so that's what I'm calculating there. Mm -hmm. So from the time scale of that emission, you can estimate um, it's very sensitive both to the radius of that material and to the shock speed. And so um, that's sort of what I'm estimating there. Mm -hmm. And so this material is likely very extended, you know, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 centimeters, which is bigger than any sort of typical star. And so that's why we think that these kinds of objects underwent this late stage inflation. And then um, you can also estimate the mass in that material based on the luminosity of that signal. So I told you about the time scale. The luminosity is just set by the energy deposited in that layer divided by the shock crossing time. And you can just show that it's it's very sen it's extremely sensitive to the velocity, uh, but then also to the mass and the radius. Yep. And so uh, by making some assumptions, uh, you typically find relatively low CSM masses in order to explain um, uh, the kind of fast time scale and high peak luminosity of these events. So uh, that's those that's the calculation that um, that I went through there. It's just a rough order of magnitude <clears throat> estimate. Great, awesome. Yep. Yep. So I guess the you know one long term goal with these kinds of things is you know, why which stars are going through this kind of late stage end of life uh, puffing up. Um, is it a particular set of progenitors in a particular set of uh, host galaxy types? Is it very common across many stellar types? Um, so I think that's a big picture question um, and a direction that this field is going in. And now maybe we can go down uh, a bit more. Oh, right, so this, these are plots just putting the properties of the host galaxy uh, into context um, with various other types of host galaxies. I won't dwell long on this, but I'll just say that basically these host galaxy properties um, are kind of similar to other engine powered stellar explosions like gamma ray bursts and superluminous supernovae. Um, you know, part of the reason why these kinds of classes of objects are of interest to the community studying massive star evolution is that uh, you know, in order to, want to produce this engine and launch this outflow, there have to be special conditions. Uh, for, there, there are special conditions required, including a very rapid rotation rate in the star's core. Um, it's thought that the star perhaps has to, be uh, has to be stripped of its outer envelope that probably requires some binary interaction. And so sort of studying the evolutionary pathways that can result in these kinds of outflows um, it seems like their host galaxies are similar. And so that's probably a clue um, as to what that evolutionary path could be. All right, uh, maybe we can go down uh, a bit further. And uh, yes, so maybe, yeah, we can, I'll talk about this figure um, one more thing. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff um, on here, but I'll just walk you through it. So on the x axis, okay, so maybe I'll just say this is a very classic 
diagram from radio supernova astronomy. So it's very common to make these diagrams when you have uh, radio observations of supernovae and then you put your event on here and that gives you physical information about that explosion and its environment. Okay. So on the x-axis, uh, you're, I'm showing the time of the observation, sort of since the explosion, multiplied by the peak frequency mm -hmm. of the synchrotron SED. Mm -hmm. So radio emission from supernovae, you know, it's typically synchrotron, it's often synchrotron radiation. And when you have synchrotron radiation, you have a basically a broken power law spectrum. And the position of that peak um, gives you critical information about the explosion and its environment. And so that, that peak frequency refers to the peak of this broken power law. And then on the y-axis, uh, I'm showing on the left-hand side the peak radio luminosity. So that's an observational quantity. But on the y on the right-hand side, I'm showing a sort of physical interpretation of that left-hand side, uh, which is just to say that the peak radio luminosity is directly proportional to the energy that's been thermalized by the shock up until that point. So that's U divided by the shock radius at that time. Are. And then uh, you can draw various lines on this diagram. So um, a sort of diagonal line is the shock speed. So you can see there's a line for 1C. So these are relative, relativistically expanding uh, ejecta, 0.1C and then 0.01C. And then there are nearly vertical lines, which correspond to the mass loss rate, which also is another way of saying, uh, of quantifying the ambient density. Those turn out to be nearly vertical um, on this kind of diagram. So increasing density goes to the right. Yes. And so then on the bottom left, uh, now, now I'll show you these points. These are basically just various stellar explosions in the literature, 2006 AJ. On the bottom left was uh, a supernova associated with a gamma ray burst. Um, 2010 BH also had an associated gamma ray burst to the right. And then going up to the right, 2007 BG, 2003 BG, those events um, to the right uh, oh, sorry. Yep, sorry. Those events did not have any detected GRB, but they did have luminous radio emission. Okay. So one of the things that's been uh, it's very unusual about this new kind of class of objects is that they're way on the upper right hand side of this diagram. So 18 tau, the CSS event and the koala, they're just in this kind of what used to be an empty part of this parameter space. Mm -hmm. And so in uh, my original paper on 18 cow, I I sort of tried to understand what it meant to be up on the upper right-hand side of this diagram. And my conclusion was that you need to have a high CSM density, which is shown by those vertical lines. That's the x-axis. Mm -hmm. And then you need to have a high uh, explosion energy. So that's the y-axis. So these are energetic explosions in a dense environment. And they've all so far uh, consistently popped up on the upper right-hand side there. So yep. that's what this plot is showing. Yep, very nice. And let's see, uh, is there, I think mm -hmm. maybe going on, that's probably the last mm -hmm. important thing. Oh, okay, so yeah, I'll talk about uh, finally the rates. So ah. one of the qu early questions we we're all asking was what is the rates of, what is the rate of these kinds of events? Sure. 18 cal was discovered so nearby, was it 60 megaparsecs that it was thought, oh, maybe this is, that means that there's a huge population of these out there. Right. Um, that turned out to not be the case. So based on my selection criteria, um, which led to us finding this event, I estimated that the rate was more similar to the rate of gamma ray bursts actually, which are very rare, 0.1% uh, of core collapse supernovae. Yes. So these are not, this is not a common class of event. It's kind of a similar uh, rate to gamma ray bursts. So this is an unusual stellar endpoint. Um, but it's still important to study these unusual endpoints because I think it's often these events that put pressure on some of the assumptions we often make about the ways in which stars evolve uh, and end their lives. Yep. And I think that's the last uh, important thing. Can you just scroll down to the end so I can make sure I didn't miss anything? Let's get that. Yeah. Great. Yep. So I mean, I'm showing the, that's a table showing rates compared to other Yep. Um, kinds of explosions. And yeah, I think that's, that's basically cool. it. Cool. So you hinted, uh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you hinted <clears throat> a couple times of <clears throat> new events post the koala. Uh, and you don't have to spill anything that um, hasn't been published yet. 
Uh, but sort of where do we go as a community, yeah. let's say over the next five years to classify these objects? What, what are they doing? Are there uh, faster follow-up alert systems, um, et cetera, things like that? Yeah, so I think with the koala, you know, the mistake we made was that we hadn't quite learned how exactly to recognize these things. So we were just slow in reacting. Now, so in October, we found another one. And this time we did not make the same mistakes. We found it and then within a few days we had started all our, all our follow-up observations. And this event, uh, which we call the camel, looks uh, very similar to 18 cow and the CSS event and the koala. So, so it's sort of, um, yeah, I guess that was sort of expected, but then also just reassuring to us technically to see that we could discover these things within a couple of days and then get all of the um, necessary follow-up observations. What was, so the, go from, what was the redshift so, on the camel? Uh, 0. 0.2442. Okay. Yep. It's also another high redshift mm -hmm. yep. event. Yep. Which, yeah, the fact that now it seems like we're finding a lot of these at higher redshift is making it difficult um, to study them. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, as as for where we go, as for where we're going to go in the future, you know, I think one basic question is just what is this particular class of events? characterizing them, understanding the uh, sort of range of outflows that this type of central engine is capable of powering. So, you know, from the few events we have so far, we have a, quite a range of shock speeds from mm -hmm. the original 0.1c of the cow to all the way up to 0.5c, 0.6c. Um, we're going, we're getting a better understanding of the range of optical light curves. They actually all look extremely similar. Um, and that also is a hint as to what the underlying um, powering mechanism could be. Yeah. It suggests that there's not a lot of variety um, in the sort of configuration at the time of explosion. Um, so yeah, just finding more is certainly a goal uh, at this point. But then I think thinking kind of in the bigger picture, really what's happening here is that our optical surveys with their improved cadence, so they're now covering huge areas of the sky at a cadence of once per day or even less, once, at, once every few hours. Mm -hmm. And that means that we're now just finding a much larger number of fast evolving and luminous optical transients of which 18 cow and its relatives are just one class. Mm -hmm. right. So thinking more broadly, trying to understand, you know, and, and something I'm working on now is just trying to understand the range of optical transients that occupy this part of parameter space. I think it's likely that all of them are arising from stars that underwent some kind of end of life, abrupt mass loss or sort of envelope mm, inflation. Okay. Where to put it. And so understanding, you know, trying to measure the amount of material that was there and at what radius and getting a handle on the whole range of progenitors. Um, so what were the compositions? Are they hydrogen rich stars? Are there, are there stars that lost their envelope? Um, I think that is uh, sort of mapping out this, um, uh, yeah, getting a picture of the very late stage uh, of the, yeah, the, the last few days even of the evolution of these massive stars very is cool. I think uh, the big picture of where we're trying to go. Very cool. I will predict there's going to be a lot of activity in this field over the next five years. Yeah. <laughs> Great. That's fantastic. Give you a lot of things to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, yeah, the, this kind of confined dense material, you know, produces a luminous optical transient mm -hmm. um, in the way that uh, and we've been finding them in that way. But then I think it's also interesting to think about what happens if you just have adjustments to that material. So picture a shell around the star mm -hmm. and you take this shell and you just bring it out to a larger radius. So that means the star ejected it earlier. Um, at, a, at a certain radius, the optical depth will drop. And when the optical depth gets low enough, you will abruptly transition from a regime where you no longer, you will no longer have an optical transient because you need a high optical depth to get that. Well, but at the lower optical depth, you could get different kinds of transients like x-ray and radio transients instead. So okay. there's, uh, I think okay. this will be a rich field yeah. for exploration uh, many years into Definitely. the future. Definitely. Very cool. Anna, thank you so much for yeah. sharing this paper with us. Thanks for having me. All right, everyone. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.